A self-made couple making plans for the next stage of their lives. They were getting ready to have a quiet retirement. They were such a beautiful couple. They would give you a shirt off their back. They had a lot of friends and loved spending time with family. Gun down, execution style, in their own home. It just seemed to make no sense. Who would do that? What could possibly be the motive? While searching for the killer, investigators uncover a world of greed and deceit. We looked at desperation. She was desperate for money. He felt he had been treated badly, basically kicked to the curb. People were saying that he was very upset. It certainly is motive. A series of chilling discoveries. We learned that he was receiving hundreds of thousands of dollars. Everything he's told us is a lie. Points to a killer no one ever imagined. People were shocked. Shows what a messed up psyche he's got. It was unbelievable how somebody can be that cold-blooded. On the outskirts of La Crosse, Wisconsin, lies the prestigious neighborhood of Barry Mills. In early spring of 2010, this quiet community is rocked by a disturbing 911 call. 40-year-old Eric Cola away from his deceased parents home while detectives head inside we could see that there was a male uh, lying on the kitchen floor there was a large pool of blood around his head the blood was coagulated so it, it had been there a while you know it wasn't fresh blood he was holding his car keys in one hand he had his coat on so it was clear that he had just walked in the door. He hadn't even said everything on the counter yet. As I viewed the male victim, the wound appeared to be a gunshot. It was near the temple of his, his head. Around the corner is like a hallway entryway with a computer desk. And the, the female victim was there. She was shot in the head also. Her head typing before she was shot. What she was typing didn't appear to be significant, but made us believe that she had no idea that someone was behind her going to shoot her. That it appeared that they ambushed them. The victims are identified as 68-year-old Dennis Cola and his wife, 65-year-old Myrna. As investigators examine the scene, they make note of other telling details. We didn't know if it was a single killer or more than one person, but you would expect more disturbance if there were more than one or that they would have overpowered victims and that, that didn't seem to have happened with Myrna sitting at the computer comfortably that led us to wonder if she was the first to be killed and her husband Dennis came home and he was the second one shot there was the smell of decomposition at that point we weren't sure how many days earlier they were killed but we needed to get information pretty quickly detectives find sign of forced entry and no indication of any kind of struggle the crime lab comes in they collect fingerprints and dna and the computer for analysis we went upstairs and we noticed in, in the one bedroom there was a dresser that was disturbed and it appeared that it had been ransacked what was unusual about it was the person started at the top and worked their way down with the chest of drawers but if you it that way you wouldn't be able to see what was in the drawer below it this looked like someone was trying to make it look like a burglary but nothing seemed to be missing and there were many other valuables in the house including Myrna's purse and Dennis the wallet was still in his back pocket it looked like this was staged quite frankly while investigators continue searching for clues they find what could be a key piece of evidence the bedroom had a 22 rifle in the it. There's also a box of 22 shells on a shelf that had been moved and 
partially opened. That was very possibly the gun that was used in the homicides. So the gun is sent to the crime lab for analysis. As the crime scene investigation continues, news of the murders spreads quickly through the close-knit community. When I heard about it, I thought, I can't believe this is happening. I was devastated. It hit me real hard. It was like, why would somebody kill them? And everybody loved them. Born and raised in Wisconsin, Dennis and Myrna Cola had been happily married for 42 years. Dennis and Myrna had a lot of friends. They had deep roots here. They had children and grandchildren, and they were very popular. Humble beginnings, Dennis rose to become a successful businessman. Dennis had graduated as a pharmacist, and he had owned a number of pharmacies and businesses throughout the years in different locations. I worked with him for two years. As a boss, he was down to earth. Fantastic guy. If you needed something, he was there. He treated me like a daughter. Dennis was successful in life and in love. Him and his wife, they were always happy, having a good time. Myrna had a lot of energy. She was very sociable. Myrna was very well educated, and she was presently teaching part-time on a substitute basis. They had a good marriage. They enjoyed life. The couple had two children, their son Eric and 37-year-old daughter Cindy. Both were married with families of their own. Their family seemed pretty tight. Dennis and Myrna, they were involved with their kids and involved with their grandkids. These were parents who were very dedicated. They really wanted the best for their kids and loved spending time with family. Dennis and Myrna were getting ready to have a quiet retirement and relaxing and enjoying life. Now, those dreams have been brutally snatched away. Both shot. I would have never, never in my life expected something like this to happen. It just seemed to make no sense. We we're trying to understand who would do that and what would be the motive. While police bring the Cola's son Eric into the station to get more information, investigators go door to door looking for witnesses. We'd start canvassing to see if anyone saw anything, uh, heard anything. Nobody in the neighborhood had seen anything suspicious. For them, it was just mostly shock. They couldn't believe that these two people had been killed. As detectives continue to search for a lead, they get their first break. One of the neighbors uh, mentioned that he thought he knew the motive and why it happened, and also the murder. He was very concerned. He believed that his life was in danger. He felt that he may be next. This neighbor, Steve Burgess, was a banker, and he thought that he may have been the intended target of the homicide. His reasoning was he had gotten a threatening call multiple times from a person that threatened to kill him. Coming up, new evidence emerges. The day after the homicide, he cashed his $50,000 check and never told us. And family secrets come to light. There was some jealousy, maybe bad blood between the two. Dennis always complained that he was worthless and that he didn't want to work. She had apparently lit it. Someone had put this threatening note in his mailbox. Now he believes that someone was out to get him. And exposes a cold-blooded betrayal nobody saw coming. I never thought he was the kind of person that would do something like that. It was extremely expected. It's just chilling. Grandparents Myrna and Dennis Cola have been brutally executed in their own home. Now, one of their neighbors, banker Steve Burgess, tells investigators the killer could be coming after him. He was uh, very concerned, and he believed that um, someone was out to get him, and he didn't know who would. Homicides may have been intended for him and his family. Detectives ask Steve why someone would want him dead. So at that time, the market crashed. There was people with money issues. A lot of people came to him at the bank for loans, but they had no collateral. So people were very angry that Steve would not give them loans. The last threat was a couple of days earlier. It was a threat of violence. It certainly had to be taken serious. If he was the intended target, how did Dennis and Myrna end up gunned down instead? 
what he explained was that Google Earth search in front of Burgess's house showed the wrong address, showed Dennis and Myrna's address instead of his, and he thought that the killer killed the wrong people. He felt that somebody had come to his house to follow through on the threat, but they ended up at Dennis and Myrna's residence. It was a concern that it possibly could have been a mistake on behalf of the murderer, and the homicides were not intended for Dennis and Myrna. Before investigators can pursue the lead, the autopsy results arrive. The autopsy report determined that they were both shot with a 22 caliber rifle. But it was inconclusive. There wasn't enough bullet fragment left to tell if it came from the gun that we found in the house. No fingerprints were found. I mean, even from the victims, like the gun had been cleaned up. The autopsy report also confirmed that they had been deceased for a few days before the 911 call. It was likely that they were killed on that Friday. The time of death sheds new light on the threatening phone call made to neighbor Steve Burgess. We saw that call had come in Sunday morning after the Kulas were murdered. So the timeline just, it didn't make any sense. We were able to determine that the threats against Steve Burgess uh, had nothing to do with uh, the deaths of Dennis Burna. With their first lead a bust, detectives turned their attention closer to home. We knew Eric and his sister, Cindy, were very close. We were kind of stocks. He was doing well. Dennis and Eric were pretty close. Some people would say, like, bread and butter. They'd have get-togethers all the time. Eric was the one that found the bodies. We needed the conversation with Eric for information that he might be able to provide us. Hoping he can provide details about the crime, investigators interview Eric at the station. Eric was still extremely emotional over the death of his parents, but he said he wanted to be as helpful as he possibly could and would do whatever he could to try to find who was responsible. Detectives asked how he came to find his parents had been killed. He said the school called and said that Myrna hadn't shown up for work. They called his parents and they didn't respond. So Eric tried calling and was unable to get an answer, so he called his sister and asked if she had any contact with them, and she had not. He became concerned and drove over to the house. Once he walked in the house, he observed his father lying on the kitchen floor and started searching for his mom and then also found her deceased. Eric said he was extremely close to his parents. His dad, you know, supported all of his endeavors, and they were just the best of buddies. We asked Eric what was the last time he had seen his parents, and he said a few days before the homicides. He visited them like he did all the time. He said his dad was working on the deck, and his mom was doing laundry. There didn't seem to be anything unusual. Investigators asked Eric where he was on the day of the murders. He said that Friday was a he and his wife's anniversary. He had worked till two, then he helped his buddy Mike do some work in a bathroom. They were renovating a bathroom. Eric had told us gone to two stores after leaving his buddy's house looking for a specific plant that his wife liked, a hanging plant. Eric presents a receipt stamped at 6.15 p.m. After he bought the plant, he went directly home and they got ready to go out for the evening with friends to celebrate the anniversary. Eric said that he had tried over the weekend to contact his parents and wasn't able to do so. He was becoming concerned but he just thought that they were busy. When asked who might have wanted to harm his parents, Eric says they were well-liked and had no enemies. It seemed really strange, really unusual. No reason for, for the victims to be killed, both victims killed. Before concluding Eric's interview, detectives get results back from the crime lab. The report came back indicating that the time of death based on the computer analysis was 5.41 on that Friday. Myrna was using the computer and the last keystroke. With the keystroke data, detectives verify Eric's alibi. We spoke to his friend Mike, and Mike said yes, Eric was here until about 5.30 uh, when he left. And he was going to go to the store, so he basically confirmed what Eric was telling us was correct. The receipt, combined with what his friend Mike said, it appeared that there wasn't enough time for Eric to commit the crime. Also, it just seemed 
uh, very unlikely that someone who loved his mother and father very much could be involved in, in something like this. Before Eric leaves the police station, he remembers crucial information that takes detectives by surprise. Eric had told us that his sister Cindy and her husband Pat were being financially supported by uh, Dennis and Myrna and that their dad, Dennis, told Cindy they were getting cut off financially. The uh, Friday morning of the homicides, Cindy had called Dennis. Dennis let her know that there was not going to be any more money. She became very upset. Had there been an argument over money leading Cindy to kill? That's extremely unexpected, but she did have motive, so he started looking at Cindy as a suspect. Police investigating the double homicide of Dennis and Myrna Cola believe their daughter Cindy may have been angry with her father after he cut off financial support. The two had a tense conversation just hours before the murders. When we started talking to the circle of friends and family, we were told Dennis was more than generous. He gave tens of thousands to Cindy and her husband. Cindy relied on her parents. They needed this money to pay their bills. When Dennis had told Cindy that, he was cutting her off. She didn't know how those bills were going to get paid. Detectives learn the Cola's children are set to inherit over $700,000 from their parents' death. While son Eric is known in the community as a successful businessman, Cindy's circumstances are different. Cindy didn't have much money, if any, and she was constantly asking for money because they were not making ends meet. She was working a minimum wage job or a little above that, and Pat, her husband, couldn't keep a job, would quit or get fired. They were living paycheck to paycheck and Dennis's handout to handout. Me and Dennis would talk about Cindy at the pharmacy. And he kept telling me that he was sick and tired of supporting her every month, helping them out with their bills and stuff like that. That Friday morning, he was very upset. And he said that I'm cutting her and her husband off. When she would get upset, she would get just extreme over the top emotions. Cindy hearing that the cash cow was being butchered would be a reason for her to now go off the rails and it went from bad to worse. Cindy became a strong suspect. Police bring Cindy into the station for questioning. Cindy appeared broke up over the deaths of her parents, but she really laid out the family dynamic. Her parents had considered her the black sheep of the family. She said that she didn't believe her parents cared about her like they cared about Eric, and she was upset with how they treated her. She told us, according to her parents, that Eric could do no wrong, and that Cindy was a disappointment and continued to be a disappointment. But Cindy denied that she had anything to do with her parents' death, even though there was this friction between them. Investigators questioned. Cindy about the argument with her father the morning of the murders. Cindy downplayed the conversation she had with her father. She said just that she was disappointed at her father and said he wouldn't give her any money. But it wasn't a negative conversation. Detectives wonder if Cindy is more guilty than she's letting on. There was a lot of tension between Cindy and her parents. There was disapproval there. We looked at desperation. She was desperate for money with the inheritance and given her bad feelings. All these things could to the fact that she may have been the one that took the lives of her parents. With suspicion swirling, police ask Cindy where she was when her parents were killed. On Friday, she was working and had left at 4.45. They have a time clock she had punched out. After work, she had uh, stopped at the store. Just after 5.30, she purchased beer and ice, and then her and Patrick had a barbecue with the neighbors. Police work confirmed Cindy's alibi. She was working. That was verified. Then Cindy had stopped at a quick trip, and the quick trips all have video, so she was on camera at a quick trip near her home at the time of the homicides, not anywhere near her parents. While Cindy is ruled out as the shooter, her husband Patrick comes into focus. Family and friends said that Patrick did not get along with Dennis and Myrna, and Patrick stood to inherit a substantial amount of money along with Cindy. Dennis did not like her husband at all. 
He told me that Cindy's husband married Cindy for the money because he knew that Dennis and Myrna had money. Dennis always complained that his son-in-law, Patrick, was worthless and that he didn't want to work. He sits and plays with the video games and he's too lazy to go find a job. Investigators dig deeper into Patrick's relationship with his in-laws. That uh, when Patrick and Cindy got married, they asked Cindy not to marry him. They felt that he lacked motivation and they remained unhappy with him. And I think the feeling was mutual. According to some reports, when there was alcohol involved, he could have been a violent person. Apparently, the uh, Friday morning of the homicides, Cindy told Patrick that they were not going to be getting any more money. People were saying that Patrick was even more angry than Cindy, that uh, they were being cut off financially. It was a large red flag. Detectives also learned Patrick had the capability to pull off an execution-style hit. Eric and other relatives were now pointing us toward Patrick, saying that he was a Marine, uh, and that he knew how to handle weapons. It certainly moves Patrick up to the top of the list as far as suspects. Police hunting the killer of Dennis and Myrna Cola believe their son-in-law, Patrick Cowell, has motive for murder. Patrick was a great interest to us because he did not get along with Dennis and Myrna, and he stood to inherit a lot of money, so it certainly is motive. And Patrick was in the Marine Corps, so he would be an expert marksman. When I heard that, the police are starting to question him. I thought maybe after Dennis mentioned cutting them off, that might have triggered his son-in-law to kill them both. At the police station, detectives confront Patrick about his relationship with his in-laws. Patrick said that he was not popular in that family, that he was not comfortable with them. They weren't comfortable with him. It was kind of a cold relationship. He knew from Cindy that they were being cut off from Dennis and Myrna. He wasn't happy about it, but he denied having any involvement in the homicides. Investigators press Patrick about where he was at the time of the murders. He was without a job uh, at the time, and basically he spent most of his day on the sofa with the uh, Xbox. We asked if he had any guns in the house, and uh, he agreed that he did. We asked if he would turn those over to us, and he said he would. As detectives wrap up their interview with Patrick, patrol officers are dispatched to collect the gun and gaming console, which are then sent on to the crime lab. The gun had been analyzed and, in fact, was eliminated as the weapon used to kill Dennis and Murdoch. Also, we were able to prove through the crime lab that he was on the Xbox at the time he said he was and were killed. With Patrick ruled out, police are left scrambling for new suspects. The unsolved homicides leave the community on edge. When a crime like this happens in a small town, like Barry Mills, there's a lot of pressure on law enforcement to get it solved. People want answers. These aren't strangers to them. These are people they know. People in that neighborhood were fearful. You know, the closer you are to something like that, the, the more concerned you are. We were kind of scared for our lives because we didn't know why something like this would happen. Looking for new leads, investigators dig into Dennis's business connections and the wealthy pharmacist other ventures around town. Dennis had a, a nephew, Nick Herring, who was promised the business from Dennis. They were going to open a, a car dealership together and actually did. What we understood was that uh, Nick was very familiar with uh, running car dealerships and had done a good job. Business was good, but then Dennis changed the deal. As the dealership was up and running, Dennis brought Eric, his son, in to start running it with Nick. And there was some jealousy, maybe bad blood between the two. Nick was like complaining all the time. So Dennis had to go help out with the business. Dennis said they could not get along together. And he ended up buying Nick out. At that point, Nick was quite unhappy. And uh, there was some falling out. Tension mounted until Dennis sold the business, leaving Nick resentful. Nick lost a, a pretty substantial amount of money. so. He would certainly have reason to be upset. 
Could Nick have harbored a deadly desire for revenge? Police bring him into the station for questioning. We spoke to Nick Herring, and he admitted that the relationship had soured. Nick had said that Dennis had given him too low amount for the business and that he got cheated out of some profit. Nick felt that he had been treated badly, basically kicked to the curb by his uncle. Despite the bad blood, Nick insists he's not involved in the murders. Nick said that it was in the past that he had started his own car dealership. He was successful and that although it was upsetting, he wouldn't hold the grudge and he had no reason to kill Dennis and murder. Nick said that he had worked until about 5.30. Then he had uh, picked up his girlfriend and they'd gone out to the tavern. We were able to confirm that he was at work all day and then the bartender where they were at could confirm that he and his girlfriend had spent the evening. And so we were able to eliminate him. Having ruled out yet another suspect, the investigation into the Cola murders hits a roadblock. Well, that uh, our, our retirement age had long, successful careers for someone to come in and just murder them. It's senseless. We were still trying to understand who would do that and what would be the motive. One week after the murders, police receive news that jolts the investigation back to life. We get a call that a patrol car is being sent out to Eric Kula's residence for a suspicious item in the mailbox. Eric said that he had got a threatening letter. He was now extremely concerned that he was going to get killed. One week after Dennis and Myrna Cola are ruthlessly gunned down in their own home, police learn their 40-year-old son Eric has received a threatening note. Could he be the next target? Someone had put this note in his mailbox. He was really, really concerned. This note said, fixed you. The message is kind of unusual, but Eric thought they killed his parents and were now going to come after him. He had no idea who would have left it or where it came from. There was an envelope, but it wasn't mailed. The handwriting looked like it was done by someone very young. It was so strange. It was probably written that way, so a handwriting analysis couldn't be done. When it comes to Eric's safety, detectives don't take any chances. We have to try to figure out what was going on. We had an investigator and a camera to watch his property. We start canvassing Eric's neighborhood to see if anyone saw anything. But with no witnesses, police are still left with no idea who placed the note. This is perplexing. We're trying to determine, was this somebody uh, local or was this someone from out of the area? We were very concerned. With this new potential threat, investigators cast a wider net to find the Cola's killer. But when they scour Dennis and Myrna's computers, phones, and finances, they're surprised at what they find. He subpoenaed Dennis and Myrna's bank records and noticed that there's a check written and cashed on Dennis and Myrna's account for $50,000. It's cashed on the day after the murder, and it's made out to Eric Kula, and was deposited into Eric's bank account. It seemed really strange. So you just found your parents dead, and the next day you go cash a check for 50 k that had to be looked at. Detectives reach out to Eric, hoping to learn more details. Eric's explanation is his dad gave it to him on the day that he had stopped over at his parents' house. That's very odd. Suddenly, we have a check for $50,000, and if everything was okay, why wouldn't he tell us about it? To have a check that was deposited the day after the murders by a family member, that set off alarms for investigators. After we find that check, we look for other checks. We used a forensic accountant to uh, review Eric's finances because it was quite complicated with the day trading that he was involved in. When the accountant went through it with us and explained what we were looking at, I think we almost fell off our chairs because we had uh, no idea that this was what was going on. He told everybody that he was extremely successful with his day trading, but Eric was 
broke. We used day trading, but it was a myth as far as making profit. The person looking at his financials basically called BS. She told us this guy's worth nothing. He's worth about 2,000 bucks total. He was blowing smoke. Then, police uncover more startling information about Eric's financial circumstances. We learn that Eric was also going to his parents and receiving large amounts of money. Through the years, it was hundreds of thousands of dollars. He led everybody to believe that he was doing so well, including his wife. Eric told her that he was making a lot of money. There was nothing to worry about, that uh, he was just doing great. Despite everyone's impression that Eric was this successful day trader, his parents had been funding his and his family's lifestyle. If he was going to have to admit that to family, friends, it was going to be devastating. Detectives learn when Dennis and Myrna stopped financially supporting their daughter, Cindy, they also cut off Eric. We knew just shortly before Dennis and Myrna were killed, Eric found out that he was no longer getting money from his parents. The damning evidence continues to pile up against Eric. Dennis told me he was giving money to Eric, but basically he was done giving to those kids. He says, I need to tell them I'm done supporting them. It's about time I put my foot down and cut them off. As investigators start to discover that Eric is not what he seems, shocking results come back from the lab. The state crime lab did a handwriting analysis on that check for $50,000. It wasn't Dennis's signature on that check. We found out that it was Eric's handwriting that he had forged his father's name on the check. Everything he's told us is a lie. So things are starting to really... Hoping to find additional incriminating evidence. We're in the basement, among other things, was a box of envelopes in a desk drawer. The fixed you know had a security envelope, and every one of them has a different pattern for their security pattern. Lo and behold, those envelopes have the same pattern. We were able to determine that envelope in Eric's mailbox with the fixed you know it came from the box of envelopes in his home. From his fire pit in his backyard, we found things that would be associated with making a fixed U note, a spring from a spiral notebook. The letter was written on spiral notebook paper, a barrel of a pen used to write the address. Those types of things are in the fire. So that fixed U note came from his house. It didn't look good for Eric. In the search, detectives also discover a 22 caliber rifle, similar to what police believe was the murder weapon. The gun is sent to the ballistics lab for testing. With the lies and forgery, we were pretty confident that Eric was our guy. But at that point, Eric had an alibi for the entire time that the homicides were occurring. So we're trying to figure out how he shot Dennis and Murdoch. Detectives investigating the double homicide of Dennis and Myrna Cola suspect the couple's own son. 40-year-old Eric is the killer, but they need hard evidence to lay charges. We went out and started re-interviewing witnesses and reviewing all the evidence that we had. As detectives try to learn more details about Eric's connection to the crime, the ballistics results come back. Police wonder if the rifle found in Eric's home will prove to be the murder weapon. Dennis and Myrna were shot with a 22 caliber rifle but Eric's gun wasn't the gun that was involved in the crime. Undeterred, detectives recheck Eric's alibi for when his parents were being murdered. The time of death, based on the computer analysis, was 541 on that Friday. Prior to the homicide, Eric said that he'd helped uh, his, his buddy Mike renovating a bathroom. When we originally talked to Mike, he said that Eric had left his house about 30. But when we re-interviewed him, he said it's very possible it could have been earlier. Once Mike's story changed, we really thought that uh, we were heading in the right direction. Investigators take a closer look at Eric's timeline. Eric had told us that he had gone to two stores after leaving his buddy's house to get a specific plant for his wife. At the time of the homicide, he had stopped at the first store. And that store didn't have it, so he had to go to the other store.
p.m. The second store is located only 10 minutes from Nicola's residence. But where was Eric at 541 when his parents were being shot? We checked with the garden center, the first one he went to, and they had plenty of those plants on the day and time that Eric said that they didn't have any. We also reviewed video footage, and he's not there, and nor is his vehicle seen coming or leaving the parking lot. So there was a window of opportunity for Eric to commit the murders. He had no alibi for the time that the computer showed that Myrna was shot. With Eric's alibi torn apart, detectives bring him in for another interview. They begin by confronting Eric about forging the $50,000 check. Eric explained that he had permission from his dad to write checks out to himself and that his dad had actually given him the check, but just was too busy, so told him to sign it himself. He told us, I write them all the time, and that that was commonplace for him to do that. It's a lie, an approvable one. He's never written one. He couldn't produce a single check that he'd ever written. He was confronted with the fixed you know it and about the envelopes and that they did come from his house. With what we found and what we knew about his financials, all of those things together are great evidence. We just went down item after item after item after item. And Eric acted, in my opinion, desperate and he wanted to leave. But Eric was no longer free to go. On July 29th, 2010, police charge Eric with the murder of his parents, Dennis and Myrna Cola. What we believe started this whole crime in motion was the fact that Eric was being cut off financially. He was desperate. Detectives pieced together how the double homicide unfolded. We believe he went to see his mom at, at their home, and Myrna was sitting at the computer, and then... Eric walked upstairs, got the gun that was located in the closet, came down and, and shot his mother, and then waited for his father to arrive. When Dennis came home, he was shot almost immediately within seconds after he walked through that door. After the murders, Eric wipes the gun clean and returns it to the closet. Eric then took a check and said to himself, 50,000 will get me through until the will is settled. After he shot his parents, he went to a garden center, bought the plant for his alibi, and went home to celebrate their anniversary dinner that night. He's as cold-blooded as a murder for hire man. His parents did nothing but love. His dad owed him a living. Eric Cola's arrest stuns the community. Everyone thought that he was this golden child, that he had a great relationship with his parents, that he was this successful day trader. That he could have done this? People were shocked. I would have never expected Eric to do this. The way Dennis talked about him, always bragged about his son, and they never thought he was, he was the kind of person that would do something like that. In June 2012, Two years after Dennis and Myrna Cola were killed, a jury finds their son Eric guilty of intentional murder. His sister, Cindy, during the sentencing hearing, was sobbing, and she begged the judge in that courtroom to make sure justice was done that day. Eric Cola is sentenced to two consecutive life terms, plus six years for forgery. Many times I've thought about how somebody could do that, and... I, I just simply can't fathom it. I guess we, we all lose a, a bit of our innocence when, uh, uh, when this kind of thing happens. Myrna and Dennis are still dearly missed by their family and friends. They were such a beautiful couple. They would give you your shirt off their back. I think of them very, very often. And my memory of Dennis is always a smiley face. I do miss a lot. Sometimes I still think, boy, why did it have to be you? He'd still be living right now, happy life, finally retired, and enjoyed his grandkids.
day trader. That he could have done this, people were shocked. I would have never expected him to do this. The way Dennis talked about him, always bragged about his son, and they never thought he, he was the kind of person that would do something like that. In June 2012, two years after Dennis and Myrna Cola were killed, a jury finds their son Eric guilty of intentional murder. His sister, Cindy, during the sentencing hearing, was sobbing, and she begged the judge in that courtroom to make sure justice was done that day. Eric Cola is sentenced to two consecutive life terms, plus six years for forgery. Many times I've thought about how somebody could do that, and I, I just simply can't fathom it. I guess we, we all lose a, a bit of our innocence when, uh, uh, when this kind of thing happens. Myrna and Dennis are still dearly missed by their family and friends. They were such a beautiful couple. They would give you your shirt off their back. I think of them very, very often. And my memory of Dennis is always a smiley face. I do miss a lot. Sometimes I still think, boy, why did it have to be you? He'd still be living right now. Happy life, finally retired, and joined his grandkids. And Myrna would probably still be dragging him on vacation.